You have a fate, a destiny calling you out there just over the horizon. Something that you could achieve, something that you are destined to do. Okay, so yes, but no. Fate is real. Luck is real. Chance is real. And yeah, there are some things you can do to kind of tune into that. As we're getting ready for Sawan and really any time of year, but we're going to focus in on Sawan today. It's a good time to check how those threads of destiny are doing for you. And remember, as always, don't take them too seriously. Don't take them too lightly. Just uh, maybe don't ignore them. Let's talk about that today as we walk together down creation's nights. Hello everyone, my name is Charlie, I am a Crystal Pagan Druid and Priest of Bridget. Hello everyone, my name is Brian, I'm a Crystal Pagan Druid and sous chef to the Donda. We are still having allergy craziness. Things are getting better, we're both feeling better. There's not a weird haze of whatever was causing our allergies outside anymore. It turns out last time while we were recording there was a weird haze in the air, like just so much particulate that it was visible. I, I don't, I just don't even know, I'm assuming that was the swamps just putting all the mildew and mold into the air. I kind of but, wonder if something blew in. Yeah, something. So if we sound a little bit rough, that's what's going on. But we're feeling better. Hopefully this will blow through and we'll be fine. And then we have to do it all again in a couple of weeks when it cools off again. So, Yay! Love this time of year. It is our fate. It is. And we're going to be talking about various methods to read your fate, to connect to it, to get a sense of what it is. We are not going to be talking about tarot cards, oracle cards, or the like today. We're actually going to be talking about that tomorrow because that's a whole topic in and of itself. Today, we're just going to be talking about various methods of divination. Before we get into all that, if you haven't already, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, whatever the terminology is on the app that you're currently listening to us on. We do original Christo Pagan and Druidic content five days a week on this channel. And you don't want to miss anything, especially with Sawin coming up. We have a lot of prep episodes to help you make sure that you are ready for it. So I'm sitting here with a list. I have a list in front of me. I'm actually gonna put it in front of Brian right now. Here's a list. Here's a list. I have a bunch of different types of divination. We it's, our... it's beyond a list. It's a magic list. Crying board list. Oh, I was getting there. You beat me through it. So on this board, we have a lot of different options like apple bobbing and bread tossing, fire gazing, wax divination, Dream interpretation. That's a juicy one. And a pendulum scrying. Black mirrors and the like. It's like my favorite. So you'll notice one thing that's not on the list. That's because pendulum scrying is my favorite. That's actually what we're going to start with. And when Brian says that he made a scrying board, he actually made us a pendulum scrying board that we're then going to use the pendulum to decide which topic we do next. And we'd see how many of these we can get through before the episode is over. Pendulum scrying. Pendulum scrying is my absolute favorite for a couple of reasons. One, it's how I was taught energy work, and it was one of the first methods of scrying I was ever taught. As such, I have developed a very strong love for it. I have practiced this form of divination for oh, in 30 years or more. It's one near and dear to my heart. Now, scrying with pendulum can be as simple as put a ring on a necklace. There you go, you have a pendulum. A lot of us back in the 90s had those crystal necklaces that we would wear and guess what that's an instant pendulum and we would use those for pendulum scrying all the time or you can give yourself a special purpose-built pendulum to use for the practice i'm actually using a wonderful amethyst one that a friend got me that i have developed a really good relationship with for this but like pendulum scrying is very simple you hold the pendulum up you make an agreement with it you can either ask the pendulum what means yes what means no and with calibration and watch how it changes motion. You can say, move back and forth for yes, move side to side for no. You do clockwise, counterclockwise, each could have their own meaning. And of course, you can create a board, which is a circle where the same thing is on two sides of a line. That's very important because pendulum swing back and forth. So if you have different things on opposite sides, you're not gonna know which one it's pointing at. So you have to send faint on both sides of the line. You could ask a lot of fun questions that way and get a lot of very interesting answers. My favorite part of pendulum scrying is how often I see pendulum videos. You know, pendulum scrying is fake, 
because your hands are imparting subtle motion to that penfold, causing it to move. Okay? See, scrying in any form is about connecting to your unconscious. It's about connecting to your intuition. Sometimes it's about connecting to another spirit and intuiting what they're saying. Yes, my hand is probably moving, adding subtle motion to the pendulum, but that that's how it works. Now, I get people being skeptical, but we will very often lose something and pull out the pendulum and just do yes, no. What was that the other day we were looking for? It was a connector to something. Yeah, one of the cord connectors. Yeah. We were trying to find it. We couldn't find it anywhere. Is it this? Is it in this room? Is it in this room? Is it in the? If you keep going until you get to a yes on that word. The only trick with the yes or no's is remember to be specific where and when appropriate in the process. Because, like in our case, we we were like, man, we still couldn't find this thing. We we're really confused by the answers we got until we the corner, but it wasn't on the floor. Yeah, but it, it wasn't yeah. on the desk. All the answers it answered correctly. Yes. for finding it. It's just that it had slid beside the desk, but had not fallen all the way to the floor. It got stuck halfway down. So it was in the room. It was not on the desk. It was not on the floor, but it was in the direction it pointed to the direction we asked. Like you answer all the questions correctly. It was just, it wasn't until after we finally found it that we went, oh yeah. Okay. I just un did not understand what it was trying to tell me. And as I am fond of saying, it doesn't matter if I unconsciously knew where the thing was and was directing us to the pendulum or if some spooky spirit was moving the pendulum and letting us know where the thing was. We found the thing through the use of the pendulum. So yes, yeah. okay, yes, my hand is making it move. If, and again, this is what we were after. We're after results more than mechanisms. Yep. The mechanics don't matter as much as people make them out to be. A lot of ritual stuff is there to make sure that you're in the right mindset to be doing the working they're more again most of this is for you not for the spirits it's kind of upsetting because they don't go to that last question when the person goes to debunk it and they go well this is you moving it right so that means that you knew the answer all along so therefore what process do you need to go through to get that information out of your own head if scrying is the answer then scrying still the answer yes you basically went in a giant circle that pointed right back to scry. Congratulations, right. you're still scry. If that's what it takes to get that out of your head, that's the same with a lot of the, the divination stuff we're going to go over is the whether it's you're pulling it out of your own intuition or from another source, the end result is still this was the tool that worked for you to get the information out. It's the moral of the story that I always go to. People take these things too seriously where they take them too light. The real solution is almost always in the middle somewhere. Does the pendulum know my fate? No. Are spirits moving the pendulum? Well, we've done experiments in the past with friends where we will actually put the pendulum on a holder and have it move on its own. Where there's no hand holding it. Yeah, where there's no hand holding it. So we have done those experiments and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And the question is, is that because a spirit was willing to participate or not? We don't know. Mechanisms are hard to determine. Results are black and white. Did it work? Did it not work? Yeah. We found a thing that would have been incredibly difficult, if not and taken him yeah. forever to find because of where it had fallen and wedged itself. We were able to find it. Now we're going to take up our pendulum and we're going to ask it, what should we talk about next? It immediately starts moving. Oh, yes. Immediately starts moving to dream interpretation. I was going to say interpretation. Like, <laughs> right away. Right away. We're asking, what should we do? Oh, it's good. It's going right again, straight to dream interpretation. Who okay. wants to know dream interpretation? Dream interpretation. Dream interpretation, or as we often call it, Patron Kalamat, which is the Hebrew term, has been a part of our practice for a very long time. Dream interpretation, now you can go very Jungian for this, and I do not recommend buying a book of dream interpretation. The symbols should be personal to you. Yes, there's some creative unconsciousness stuff of sometimes water usually has certain meanings and fire usually has certain meanings, but they may have different or nuanced meanings for you. And so figuring out your ideal meaning of your own symbols is important. For me, one of the things I like to break it down with is remembering that, first of all, there's several translation layers going on. You have the message in whatever language it's originally translated, whether that's from your unconscious another spirit, divine, wherever it is, that is then 
being translated into your unconscious mind, your, your spirit mind, which is then being translated into the best language it can do that you would understand, which you then have to translate into the language you regularly use. So you're, it's a telephone game to start with. You got to remember it's a telephone game. There's a lot of tricky spots where tr stuff can get lost in translation. And German interpretation has two main modes that you want to go through. The first is you're very personal, very idiosyncratic. And once you start realizing that this person has this meaning for me, or this image, this item is symbolic of this kind of thing, that very idiosyncratic, this is where dream journaling is very important, cataloging what those meanings are, really interrogating those, maybe taking those on into some kind of an active imagination practice to dig in deeper. It's very, very handy. We can talk about dream interpretation and active imagination further in future episodes. If you want, let us know. One of the best ways is to find friends who like talking about dreams. Don't just bring your dreams on people because some people don't like that. We'll hear this way. Some people like to go watch their fantasies. Some people like to go and play in sci-fi. And there's a bunch of people that like their nonfiction. Dreams is probably going to be more your sci-fi and fantasy friends and not your nonfiction friends because... Some people just don't have room for them in their life. And it's fine. Share your dreams with the, with the simple friends. Now, what you'll notice happening here is in recounting the dream to another, you will often discover meanings that you had missed because we tell stories differently when we tell them to ourselves and when we tell them to other people. So that is a very good use. Also, your friend may be like, oh, wait a minute. Do you think that has anything to do with and maybe bring up a memory or something that happened with you. Now this, like I said, this is best done with friends rather than like a group of people that don't know you very well. Yeah. Because they may see connections to your own life that you don't, you may see connections in their life that they don't. That's really what makes this powerful as a group activity, but it's a wonderful tool. They can now, also help vet because some dreams are just stress dreams or anxiety dreams and some are just the brain processing stuff. And they can also help vet that as well so that you can go, Oh, all this nonsense is not some kind of secret cult message that I'm receiving from beyond. It's actually just, I ran into a bunch of random stuff throughout the day versus, oh, this actually is something that has meaning that I need to take further action on. Learning when to take our dreams more seriously is very much an art. It is. It can be very helpful to have a friend with you to help you do that discernment for each other so you can figure out when you need to be taking them more seriously in Manito. Now, this time of year is a very good time to do dream interpretation because with the other crowd, very active. With the ancestors, very active. If you are not a person who is sensitive, if you are not a person who has developed your abilities for mediumship or channeling, which I do believe are abilities open to everybody. I don't think you have to be something special. Just some people have that switch turned on by default and some people don't. If you're one of those people that doesn't have that switch turned on yet, or you're not very confident with it, it is much easier for the other folk and for the ancestors to talk to us through our dreams. When our guards are down, where we're already in this imaginal state where it's easier for them to communicate. Sometimes it's very, very obvious that the ancestor will just show up in the dream and talk to you. Easy dreams to interpret. Sometimes, like, I know when I'm feeling alone or lost, I will very often have dreams with either butterflies flying around or bells ringing in the background or both. And that's one of my grandmothers. I've come to realize over the years that that's one of my grandmothers. She loved both of those things. And those are symbols that appear in my dreams when grandma's trying to do one of those, don't worry, I got you. You're not alone. I got you. I found it to be very comforting because those are a sign for me. Whatever I'm worrying about, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. We just got to work through and get to the other side. Sometimes, like I said, your ancestors just show up in the dreams and have full on conversations. Like I, I used to have a, a series of dreams when I was a child. They happened almost annually. It started out almost like bad Ghostbusters. <laughs> like I was there and I was being haunted. And now as I've matured more, I realized that this wasn't a nightmare. It was probably my brain trying to translate the, it's a message from a spirit. But as a child, the only context I had was I just watched Ghostbusters and Ghostbusters was in my head. And so therefore it was, it was a kind of a, it started out almost uh, 
it wasn't quite a full nightmare, but I was basically, the ghost was trying to talk to me and I was running from it because it was scary and I didn't really want to be talked to or bothered. Then once I got past that part of trying to run, it then showed parts of the house. It was always so weird because it was always like I'd see a part of the house. First started with the kitchen, but the kitchen and the living room weren't right because it was actually a dining room and there were wood floors, but that wasn't the right flooring. There was this whole extra room on the house, but that was a carport. It was very confusing. Well, later that year, the parents started a construction project that actually turned the carport into the living room, turned the what was the living room into a dining room, rewrote the whole house. And the next year I had a weird dream about the dishwasher not being where it was. It was, and there was this whole island counter. It was just so strange. And they did a whole renovation and changed the house later that year. And it was like every year I'd have a dream about some modification that was going on in the house. Dream interpretation is kind of weird like that. Very literal in what it's trying to tell you. And sometimes it's very figurative. Sometimes it is a message. And now is a very good time of year to do that. Let's see what the next topic should be. So crystal out. Ah. Right away, we have an answer. I love this crystal. This crystal and I. I'm laughing because it's friends. It's the one I did not want to do. It's the one you did not want to do. It's the one I really did not want to do. You get the one you really want to do, and now you get the one you really don't want to do. Uh, So apple bobbing and bread tossing. Apple bobbing had a lot of different meanings over the years. Usually when people would do apple bobbing, you would put in a bunch of red apples and one green apple. A meaning would be ascribed to the golden apple. So whoever pulled out the golden apple would be the one who would have blessings for the year, would be the next person to get married for the year. Because one of the things you're going to look at when you start doing traditional divination is so much of them was about who's going to get married and who are you getting married to. That was a lot of old school divination practices were about that. A mean would be pre-ascribed to the apple. And then whoever was able to pull it out would be the one who would receive that blessing. Sometimes they were almost cursed apples and that whoever pulled out the golden apple would be the one who would have the most problems in the next year. So nobody wanted to get it, but you know, the apples would be in there very thick. So it'd be hard to keep your eyes open to make sure you got the one that you wanted. So for those listeners like me who only learned this year that that's actually a form of divination, I grew up thinking apple bobbing was just this Halloween party thing that you did. I loved apple bobbing. I, I had no idea that was a form of divination. Oh, almost all of the weird practices that we have were a form of divination. Yeah. At some point. They turned it into a party game. Well, they were party games. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. They just had different meanings. Now, bread would have been mortified if they had known. (laughs) Bread tossing is weird because there are many versions of this. One, it is very traditional when doing your offering to the other crowd to make a special loaf of bread and to toss it in either in a hole or to break off parts of it and toss it over your shoulder. This would often be done when asking for favors from the other crowd where if you wanted a blessing, you would toss it over your right shoulder. If you wanted a curse on somebody, you would toss it over your left shoulder. That's kind of the offering ritual version of it. Now, because this is a bonfire night, this would sometimes be mixed with, you would stand with your back to the fire. You would ask very specific questions. You would ascribe a meaning. So if it went into the fire, that was either a yes or a no. You would ask your question and toss the bread and then you'd see where the bread landed. You could also do very nuanced questions with us because how close did they get to the fire? Go to the fire and bounce back out. Yeah, it, it, it's a weird practice. It's one that I don't know how common it ever was. I think the offering ritual version of it was probably more common than the divination one. But it it, it was a thing. And we do have <clears throat> records of it as being something that was practiced. So, yay. Now I've talked about the two that I didn't really want to. Chris will be nice to me. We have some time left. In the episode, let's have a good topic. And oh, we're just going to go around the circle. Trying to figure out. That's hilarious. It started spinning, and then it went to a line. Yeah. <laughs> like, clearly. Okay, so the next one is fire gazing. All Idea. right, so on the topic of fire, I guess we're just continuing on. It's kicking us on topic here. Fire gazing is one of my favorites. Now, there are two ways to do this. There's the one that is probably better for your eyes, and the one that's really bad for your eyes. Based on your age and your willingness to potentially cause problems to your eyes, you can pick the one that you want today. So fire gazing is just that. You stare into the fire. While you're looking into the fire, like with any kind of scrying, you're looking for shapes, images, thoughts, intuitions that come out. Now, the safer way to do this is you look just past the fire at the shadows. 
or the the way the light is reflecting on something. If you want to do this in a way that's not going to like burn the image of the fire into your cornea for a while, set up a candle, set up a surface in front of you, and watch the flickering on the surface. I'm cracking up because I'm sitting there going, there's a safe version. I stared into the fire every time. I did too. Uh, But I have really bad eyes today, kids, so maybe that's not the best option. You have really good eyes, so. But you're looking for shapes. Because remember, scrying is all about intuition. You are trying to see what you can see. Now, you have to be very careful with taking any kind of scrying too seriously. This is something you learn through experience going forward when you're just doing wish fulfillment and when you're actually intuiting something. Because it's very easy for us to be all excited about a project, a thing, something we want to have happen in the future and be like, I saw it in the fire. I saw it in the fire. Da, 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 da. Right? And here's your little reminder also when it comes to wish fulfillment, you can be both wish fulfillment for good wishes and wish fulfillment for bad yes. wishes. Because the brains are crazy things and they're, they're not always good wishes. Anxiety makes people's brains do crazy stuff. It makes you see a lot of things that aren't actually there. Yeah. This is one of those things where, like with all magic, all magic is experimentation. You need to start learning, oh, I had that feeling and it actually meant what I thought it did. That intuition was correct. I had that feeling it didn't end up the way that I wanted it to. That intuition was not. And start learning the process of learning when your intuition is right and when your intuition is wrong and what subtle differences were there in the way that that intuition felt and how you experienced it and everything, you will get better over time. Yeah, it's going through the five powers over and over and over. It's a constantly repeating cycle. Every time you go through it, it gets a little bit better, a little bit better, because you start to learn more and more. Like the other day, I was in some prayer time, have a very foreboding moment, messages of dread. And thankfully, because I'd been going through the cycles and everything, I was able to realize, oh, all these sources, this is internal anxiety. This is not a message of anything. I need to just set myself down and go, it's all good. Calm down. It's okay. Have a moment with myself. <laughs> then could get back to the rest of the... It's, like I said, it is one of those things you get better about. Yeah. So don't take your intuitions too seriously when you first start frying. You will start developing an understanding of when you should take it more seriously and when you shouldn't. When you are actually feeling something and when you're not, it is a lot. It is a learning process. It is an art, not a science. And so... The only way to get better at it is practice. You may not like water divination or fire divination or pendulum divination or any of the ones that we've talked about, and that's fine. You may not like doing divination at all. And that, again, is fine. Divination is not about telling us what will be. It's about telling us what could it be. As we're at the start of the year, it is very traditional to do cloud watching and look to see what the weather is going to be to try to divine the weather. You know what? We don't have to do cloud watching anymore. We have really good science now. We can actually intuit fairly well the generalized trends for the weather. And that's great, but it is a form of divination. It's a predictive model that is using trial and error to get better and better and better at predicting the future. If you want to do your weather witching, go ahead. But remember, there are also predictive models out there that you can test yourself by. Are you better or worse than that particular predictive model? Because I know for us here locally, I tend to be a little bit better because... The predictive models are looking more at the bigger cities that are pretty far away from us. And so they're not as zeroed in and accurate about exactly where we are. That's, again, something you learn over time. You can't just say, I'm really good at intuiting the weather. What you've discovered is you're very good at intuiting the weather here. Everything is about constant experimentation. And with with that one approaching, it is really good for us to take this time. This may be the only time of the year you do it if it's not something that you really resonate with and want to connect with, but this is a very good time of the year to get started with it and to try it because the spirits are going to be very active. The full moon this year was crazy strong. Like, hey, people were feeling it. We were feeling it. Went online and everybody was like, man, the moon, is is it just me or am I losing it? What's going on? No, I was doing a little energy work with the pendulum during that time and the thing was practically swinging sideways. Spinning so hard. Helicopter. It was spent to a helicopter blade. It was also like, hey, I know that's not my hand because my hand would have to move a lot harder to cause it to spin that hard. Yeah, this is this year seems to be a really good year to get started with it. The energy seemed to be very, very powerful and a good way to connect. So tomorrow we're going to be talking about tarot cards and oracle cards, the differences between them 
and these more scrying divination techniques. Those you'll see tomorrow. There's a big world of difference between them. So don't forget to check back for that. If you're like, well, why didn't you chuckle up cards? Trust me, big topic in and of itself. <clears throat> Did we miss out on your favorite form of divination other than the card reading? Again, we're doing that tomorrow. The only thing that was left on our list that we didn't get to was wax reading. And black mirrors. And black mirrors, which black mirrors is one of my favorites, but the pendulum said no. Oh, um, <laughs> not to Dick. Not to Dick. Well, that probably would have been the whole episode if we did Black Mirrors. Probably... Let me know. What are your favorite forms of scrying? How do you do your, your divinations, especially this time of year or any time? In the comments. If you're listening to us on Spotify or YouTube, you can leave a comment right there. If you're listening to us anywhere else, even if it says you can leave a comment, they do not notify us. So you can leave one there because Engagement is awesome. And head over to creationspaths.com, click on chat, and you can leave your comment there. Love to know. Because sometimes people do forms of scrying that I've never heard of. And there's a lot that we didn't cover. Like, there's a lot that we didn't cover. This is a huge, huge, huge topic. If you all want to vote on one to have us talk about it later in November or December or something, we can, we can always pick it back up. It'll be based on popular demand. While you're over there, if you happen to have a few dollars you can pass our way, you could sign up for a membership. That really does help us out. You can also support us on Patreon and Ko-fi. I am CE Dorset on both. That money goes to help us keep the power on. He put it on our table and a roof over our heads. So thank you very, very much to everybody who does that. If you don't have any money, don't worry about it. You can just help us out by spreading the word about what we're doing. Help other people find the podcast and might enjoy the podcast. We've been growing super fast lately, and I feel like that has to do with y'all. I was seeing in our analytics a lot of clicks in from Facebook and WhatsApp. And so I know that's not us. We're not sharing into those places. That has to be y'all. Thank you so much for sharing us. It really does help us to spread the it's spread. The work we're doing with more people. And as always, we like to end with a prayer. So may the one spirit guide you to the way that you can connect to your own intuition and the spirit's best, so that you may see the threads of fate that are stretched out before you and find the bright path forward. Amen. Amen. Amen.